Audio Frontier. Hello and welcome to One Last Match. It's the podcast that lets footballers play out their last game again, but on their own terms. I'm Mark Benstead and this week we focus on a man who made his name as a legend for Bradford and Rangers, as well as having successful stints at Sheffield United and at Everton. It's the former Scotland midfielder, Stuart McCall. Uh, but first, a quick thanks to our sponsors, Who Knows Wins, who are changing the way that you enjoy sport. It's the social sporting app that allows you to make your predictions in a league against your friends or against your family, colleagues, well, basically anyone. And there's real money on the line. Or alternatively, you can join one of the public leagues that's already up and running and pick your wits against, well, yeah, other people in the community. There's over 10,000 players in it at the moment. You can download the Who Knows Wins app on the App Store or Google Play and get a piece of over the £250,000 it's been one so far. So put your money where you made so, and who knows wins. Uh, but now let's kick off with Stuart McCall's One Last Match. Okay, this is One Last Match where we give former players the chance to imagine running out in front of a packed house one final time. There's no injury halted finale. There's no last day defeat in front of three men and a dog. They pick the perfect venue, the perfect team to play with, who they want to play as well. Uh, the guest this week was an FA Cup runner-up. Uh, he won five league titles in Scotland. Then he won three Scottish Cups and two League Cups as well. Uh, 40 caps for Scotland, one goal, which was scored at a World Cup Finals. Not too shabby. Stuart McCall is the guest on this episode. Stuart, talk about, we'll get to the fact we're going to conjure up your, your dream finale in a second, but talk to us about your actual finish to your career. You played quite long on to the age of about 40, I think I'm right yeah. in saying. Why did you decide to, to keep going? What kept you going? Oh, I was fortunate. I, at 38, when I left Bradford, um, Neil Warnock came in for me. Um, and it was probably time to hang my boots up then. Um, but I went down, saw it was at Sheffield United, some good young talent. Um, went there, probably had the season of one of the best seasons in Sheffield United's history. Got to two cup semi finals, FA Cup, League Cup, got to the playoffs. Um, and it was just the. I think it's just the. You don't want to like, disappear. You know, when you, you love doing something like you, you did. And, um, I managed to play another 80 odd games, two seasons, uh, and it was fantastic. You know, you, you don't. I, I was fortunate. I managed to keep reasonably fit, um, and I played in a side that I didn't have to do too much running. So it, it went like that. But I remember the. It was the first. I remember my last game. It wasn't through my decision to retire. Neil, um, you know, retired me from, and, and rightly so. Um, so it was in the. I think it was a. When the League Cup game was the first game of the, one of the season, I'd just come for, turned 40 in June. I didn't think I'd play, but Neil threw me. Um, I played a week aside in the League Cup, I think, for one of the first games. And I remember, I think it was down at Shrewsbury, and I was on the edge of the box for a corner, and the ball got headed out over my head, and I was still favourite to get it. I think a guy who was on the back post run by me from the edge of the box and, and did a full length sprint, and uh, I was in. You know, I had lead boots on, I was in quicksand, I was, you know, it, it, it was time. And I knew it then, I, I got, took off at half time, um, and that was my, my last game I played. But I, I can always say I managed to 40. Was that hard, or because you knew it in your head yourself, like you accepted it because you realised you quite weren't at yeah, what you wanted to be? That's right. And I, and I think, you know, to be fair, the two seasons I had at Sheffield United was, were, were, were fantastic. Um, but you know, age, age finally catches up with you. The squad got better. There were better players than me. You know, when I'd merited playing, you know, the two seasons previously, I didn't. Now we brought some good players in the club, um, and yeah, and I'd become um, assistant manager. And I think at time would then to then go down the coaching route. You know, I still joined in in the training and played some reserve games, but I wasn't at a level anymore. Um, you know, to play in the first team. That Sheffield United season, mm -hmm. the playoff final two. Cup yep. semis and the semis you lost to Arsenal and Liverpool yep. I think in the game yep. so big good yep. teams who went on to the final and did well yep. what was it about that team and that season and, and what enabled you to play to the level you did because it was a, you were a consistent performer throughout yeah well I, I think it was funny because I look back and I, I got released at Bradford um, at 38 and I could have gone to two or three different clubs around the Yorkshire area for more money um, you know Sheffield United I went down met Neil which was great um, showed me how he wanted to um, wanted to, to play and I remember playing the first pre-season game at Scarborough and uh, you know I'm looking down I'm seeing Michael Brown and Robert Kozluk 
two hours before kick-off, eating a candy floss, going around in the dodgems because we're playing Scarborough away in the first pre-season game. And I played in that game and uh, I was terrible. I couldn't get around the park. I was hopeless. And I remember being on the bus coming home and driving and, and saying to Mrs. I shouldn't have done it. I should have hung my boots up at 38 because, you know, I, I, I was miles off the pace. And uh, apparently, speaking to Neil years later, him and Kevin Blackwell are having the same conversation <laughs> at the front of the bus, <laughs> saying, what have we done? Um, good job you only got me on buttons as well. Or, you know, you want to know they paid money for me. Um, but the season started and uh, I think we had a poor start. We got beat at Coventry and then got beat home at Portsmouth. And then we went to Burnley and I think we had a few injuries. And uh, Neil threw me in and I think we managed to win the game 3-2. And I stayed in the side, and um, we had, a, you know, Michael Tong, Jaggy Elka, Michael Brown. You know, we had we had some good players, and uh, the, you know, the season just got better and better. And you know, we went to Old Trafford and got beat, you know, by uh, Arsenal one nil. Um, Seaman made the save of the century off Pesky Salido. We'd have gone to extra time, and we actually beat Liverpool in the first leg two one. Michael Tong got both. And we got beat um, at Anfield 2 0, and then unfortunately got beat in the playoff final against Wolves. So, no, it, it, it was just special times. Um, as I say, I managed to play two full seasons, um, 80 odd games. Uh, and, you know, after the first game, my first pre season game, I never thought I'd do it again. So, to go and do another 80 odd was, uh, was brilliant. Okay, for those of you watching this, you'll have noticed one subtle difference that's just happened. We're outside, we were inside. Love to tell you what happened, but it's a secret. <laughs> just, just bear with us. This is much nicer. Okay. So you spoke about your actual end to, to your playing days. We reimagine that you've got a chance to walk out again. We get you to choose who you play with, who manages you, who your teammates are, who the opposition is. Let's start with where you'd want to play. Where would you want to play your, your final game, Stuart, if you could choose somewhere? Yeah, I think. listen, I think it's got to be uh, Hamden Park. Um, I remember making my debut there for Scotland against uh, the World Cup holders at the time, Argentina. Um, prior to Italia 90 and not only playing against them, beating them 1-0 um, and knocked the ball down for Stuart McKimmy, smashed it in, full house, under the lights, unbelievable atmosphere. Um, naturally, if we can beat the World Cup holders then the Titan Army think we're going to go win the World Cup in Italy, but obviously that didn't happen. But yeah, and I was so fortunate to have so many good uh, uh, cup memories there as well, so it would be Hamden Park. Well, was Scotland always something? particularly special for you? Was it, was it a bit different because of the whole kind of growing up in England mm. but, but that kind of Scottish core to you? Well it, it was because um, originally you know I got picked by Scotland under 21s by Sir Alex Ferguson and uh, England under 21s um, on the same day um, and you know I, my, my heart wanted to go with Scotland because I'd always been brought up even though I was born in Leeds always been brought up Scottish um, but my head at the time and the, the, my manager, current manager, Trevor Cherry, at the time we played for England, the, the staff all thought I should go for England. Um, so I ended up picking England. Um, you know, I got a nice call from the Scotland manager on the same night, Jock Steen, the late great Jock Steen, who you know, says he's you know, disappointed I've made my choice but wished me all my best in my career, which was, was quite incredible really. And then uh, you know, I went away with England, didn't play, came back and cut long story short, I changed my mind and I never thought Scotland would ever come back for me. But, you know, in the fullness of time, a couple of years later, I made my debut for an, as an overage player in under 21s against England, against Gaza and the like at Forest. Um, so it meant a lot to me because it looked like something I would I would never do. You know, um, so you know to go on and get 40 caps, um, you know, was was really special naturally. So you get to play your final game at Hampden Park, the somewhere that's special to you. Mm -hmm. Who would you want to have in the dugout for that game? You get to pick the manager. Yeah, again. And that's no disrespect to, to any of the fantastic managers and different characters I've played with. You know, from from starting out the game, you know, Roy McFarland and then Trevor Cherry at Bradford in the early days, you know, not only great players but you know, set standards, you know, great professionals, always held me in good stead what a professional should do and what it should be like. Um, and then and, and then moving on through my, through my career and going to Everton and playing under Colin Harvey, who was a midfielder at the time, you know, a brilliant midfielder, but you know, really good good person, good manager helped me. Um, and then in the fullness of time, finishing up with, with uh, going through with Paul Jewell, you know, got promotion at Bradford, terrific, and then finishing up with, with Neil Warren at Sheffield United, you know, different um, styles, all of them, Neil especially, but, you know, what success he's had. So, you know, I've been fortunate to play, 
um, with some great managers and assistant managers. But I think the one that stands out for me is uh, is I call him Sir Walter Walter Smith at Rangers. You know, um, not as much for his coaching or you know, it's just my management being the person he was. You know, I, the old saying you go through a brick wall for him, and I think majority of players that played for him, you know, would say that about him. He just had an aura and a way of working, um, treat you like a man, and you know, I had uh, great respect for him. Was the key to, to Walter that he, he treated, he looked at the individuals and knew what to do for the different guys in the team, wouldn't treat them all the same? Was that the way he went about it? Yeah, you know, I can you know, say in, in the seven years I was there, I was fortunate only to fall out with him twice. Um, not like some, I think he were up in, <laughs> up in his office every other week. So, What did you fall out with him twice over? Uh, well, the, f the first one, one, I was supposed to sign a new contract and I, I, I was with the... Uh, I got picked for Scotland. Now Walter always encourages his players to go and play for play for Scotland, unlike maybe his predecessor Graham Sooners, who I believe weren't too keen on players going away. But I think you know Walter, you know, encouraged and, and, and was proud that a lot of his players were getting picked internationally. And, you know, a lot of Rangers players were picked, getting picked at that stage. Um, but I remember getting a, a, a dead leg um, on the Saturday, um, and I was meeting up with Scotland to play. And actually, I think it was Craig Brown's first game on the Tuesday night away to Italy or the Wednesday. Um, and Walter said, "Listen, if you go." and you declare yourself fit and you come back injured, then you can forget your new contract. Um, I says, right, I'm not stupid. So anyway, it went over. A dead leg, you know, it's a muscle injury. It, it, it writes itself within a, a few days, which it did. Um, I went out and played, played against Italy. As I said, Craig Brown's first game, we got beat 3-1. And I remember in the last minute of the game, Dino Baggio landing on my ankle, my ankle, size of a football. I came back actually through the airport on crutches. Although I was only out for a couple of weeks, I saw Walter and he was raging. But, you know, it was a bit unfair because if I'd have played with my original injury, my dead leg, and it hadn't been right, fair enough. Mm. But because I got a, a total different injury. But so we didn't really fall out. He just didn't speak to me for a week while, and my contract got put on hold for three months. Um, but I think the only one one real falling out I had um, was the last season, and we were going. We went to Hibs, and we'd been knocked out of the cup, uh, knocked out of Europe. You know, I think the gaffer was getting a little bit of flack, and we changed the whole. The whole squad, I think four Italian lads had come in with a few Scandinavians boys. I remember the Friday night in the hotel um, in Edinburgh. And I think there was only myself, Gordon Jury, maybe Derek McInnes, but there was only three or four Scottish boys. And we were around the, the, the dinner table on a Friday night trying to emphasise to everybody how important this game at Hibs was. Um, you know, we were going neck and neck with Celtic for the title. Uh, and we were really pumped up for it. And then we came down and um, we had the pre-match meal and then Walter named his side and me and Juki were on the bench and I remember Archie um, after the tickets after the after all the boys are going back to get on the bus down the stairs and Archie asked me if I wanted any tickets and I says no you can stick your tickets I was raging um, and I remember you know Walter saying well do you want to be sub I went no I don't want to be sub I want to play as if, he, if he's going to change his mind wait a minute lads come back you know Stuart <laughs> decides he wants to play but I was just so we pumped up that night before, knew how important this game was. I'd come back from it, I'd been out a, a year with my knee, so you know I'd had a few games and probably the right decision. But I was so gutted. Um, and you know, anyway, I, I walk out, and Archie asked me tickets, I said no, and I pulled the door behind me, and it was a really hot day, and I remember the windows being up in the hotel. Um, and I'd pulled the door, and it was a big oak door, and the door slammed behind me. And it was a dual staircase down to the bottom of the, the foyer, and I got down to the bottom, there's loads of Japanese tourists checking in and Walter must have heard the door slam or obviously heard the door slam I think everyone heard the door slam and he f came belting out down the down the other side of the staircase and met me at the bottom and told to get me bag get a taxi or get myself back to Glasgow um, with a few expletives thrown in and Archie come behind him and Archie says do you want to be a sub? do you want to be a sub? are you going to be a sub? I went, please, Archie. Yeah. He said, we'll just sneak on bus then. <laughs> so, gone from Walter was actually raging with, and rightly so. Anyway, got, got on a bus, um, went to the game with three, two one down uh, at half time, and he decided to bring me bring me on. I thought, right, well, I'll show him. I think in 30, 30 seconds I did. I got the ball, I probably lost it. Hibs went three one up. Um, anyway, we managed to come back. Gaza got one from 30 yards, Albert scored from 30 yards, and I slipped Marco Negri through. You know, you know, 15 minutes to go to get the winner 4-3 uh, 
and I remember it on the Monday I went to see him and he was doing his press ups and his sit ups and I went over him and he says right if you're going to have a go at me let me get up and he was a big man was <laughs> a gaffer but I'd only gone to see him about a previous having a day off on a Tuesday for a funeral or something previously but um, yeah I was fortunate I only felt his wrath once or twice um, but I think it was just the respect of him I think all the players had it I certainly had it from day one didn't know him I was going to Rangers um, the previous I'd been tapped up when Graham Soonis was in charge, obviously he moved to Liverpool. I didn't know who Walter was. Um, I didn't know, I'd never heard of him, you know, coming down from England, didn't know much about him. Uh, but him and Nats had a great combination and, um, yeah, nobody better to be to be in the dugout for me for my last game. Which was which was more frightening, that the Walter Sturr or Archie when he was in <laughs> full flow? Well, I think I was quite fortunate. Again, I think, you know, if you were in Ar Archie's, one of Archie's good boys, you were OK, and I think I, I fell in that category. Um, Again, great respect for Archie. I, I, again, only fell out with him once. It was Ajax um, away from home, but you know, a uh, bit of both. Um, but like I said, they, ne they never held grudges. You had your argument, you sort it out like men, um, and you move on. Um, but no, they, they, like I say, they both could, they both could lose it, but they also both could part in and, and really enjoy the good times, which we're fortunate enough to have many of. So you've picked your manager. You're going to pick your team in a second. You also get to pick someone to sit next to you on the bus going to the game. So this is good because ah. this person who you sit next to doesn't have to go in the team. <laughs> One of those guys who's just good for the journey, good for the squad, good for morale, whatever you want, you can pick someone else. Yeah. There's a good way to crowbar in one of the good guys wow. who might not necessarily make the cut when it comes to, to yeah. playing your final game. Well, you've hit me with a stunner there then because, um, and now you've also, I think, I believe, I've got to put myself in the team. You've got to play, yeah. Ah. It's your final game. You can't be on the bench. Of course. For... Right, so I'm going to have to take somebody out who I had in that role. Um, so I've always tossed up in the middle of the park between George Alberts and Ian Durant. Mm -hmm. you know, but George was fantastic. Great guy. Scored goals for fun. Great left foot. But we Durant eh, always turned up in the big games. European games. Rangers v Celtic. Many times he's got the match winner. Um, so I suppose if you want somebody next to you, um, I think George would be too busy having a fag, so I, don't, I won't want to sit next to George. But Lee Giranti, his patter, his, his enthusiasm, his nature, um, although he'd be absolutely gutted he won't play in, <laughs> he'd have to go on the bench. Uh, yeah, I think it'd be, it'd be in Giranti, you know, a terrific guy, um, great stories, you know, you can tie anybody up with, with, the, with the tales that he's got. Unfortunate, people say, I never knew him before his injury, but mm -hmm. he would have gone on to be world class well. You know, as I said, the time I had playing with him and in training, um, it, it was outstanding. D didn't play regular, wasn't always a, a number, you know, first one on the team sheet. But I tell you what, when the big games come, came along, he was there and uh, he, he thrived in them atmospheres. So, yeah, I think, you know, I'd have we we on here next to me. Let's see who's involved in your team then. You played with some fantastic goalkeepers, mm. uh, Jim Layton, Neville Southall, Andy Gorham amongst the, the selection. Who would you put in goal if you had to pick want to, to line up for you in your, in your final match? Yeah, I think if, I, if I'm being honest, when I went to um, Everton and I had three, I, I love my time at Everton, three great years, and I think Big Nev won player of the year, every one of them. He carried us for a lot of times, to be honest with him. Um, and I never thought I would ever come up um, or play alongside, or play with a goalkeeper as good as Nev. Um, you know, his presence, everything about him, um, he, he, was, he was outstanding. But when I went to Rangers, um, you know, obviously Andy Gorham. You know, he had two seasons, Andy, before he had problems with his knee, where he was virtually unbeatable. You know, for a small guy, he didn't have the presence of Big Nev. Um, leader, leader in the dressing room, hated losing goals in training, you know, most goalkeepers do. But a real strong desire to succeed and had a sticky start to his, 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 his start at Rangers, his first game. I played in it, you know, at Hearts, Scott Crabbe's shot. He, and they thought it was going wide. Well, it was. It was wide of his left hand, but unfortunately, it nestled in the bottom corner, and the beaters won nil. And then he had a little, you know, error against Sparta Prague, where one and only time I scored two goals for Rangers, um, we were winning two 0 We're going through, and him and Nizzy had a collision and lost a goal. And Andy was following on from, uh, you know, Chris Woods, who was well revered by the supporters at, at Rangers at the time. It was big gloves to fill, if you like. But once Andy settled in, we began to saw. You know, begin to see the, the real class he had, um, and as I say, even in training, you know, you know, like some McCoy and here, they struggled to beat him, and you know, he had a two-year period prior to his knee where he, he was for me unbeatable, and probably I had to pick, 
you know, people ask me the best players I've played with. He was probably a one world class player at that time in a certain period where I think he could have played in a world 11 under because he was that good. That's a, that's, that's a big mm -hmm. claim for, for, for the players you played with yep. and also the, you know, the players who were out there. Yeah. Was it his, was it just a, a, a desire? Was it mm -hmm. a, his ability? Was it, what was it that stood out for you, that it, made him that fit for you? Everything, his mentality. He hated losing goals, obviously, that's first and fourth things we've got, but worked so hard at his game. Um, you know, whether now, you know, you've got to be good with your feet, mm -hmm. you know, the goalkeepers now, he'd have to do a lot of work on that. But he's all round it. What he made up, lack of his inches, he made it for his courage, his decision making. Um, you know, I think it's, it goes without saying. You know, the, you know, number of times he, he made unbelievable saves, especially in big games. You know, well, you look I was going to say in the games against Celtic, he, was think, was his presence in the team almost enough yeah, to have an effect yeah. on Celtic by the end of it? Because he, yeah. he, he always turned it on. In I, I think so. Winning mentality. I think everyone will remember his save. I think we drew three all at Highbrooks and Van Hooydonk you know, three yards out, and they spread his body. Um, but he was brave. I think he, he had great courage, you know, and you know he always had believed in himself. When people had one v ones against him, you know, we would be quite confident. You know, we could play a high line sometimes because you know one v ones. He always got a, a nick on it with his heel or you know a touch on it. Um, and yeah, as you say, when people ask me best Rangers player we played with, obviously Loudrops and Gascoigne and people like that, um, different people, golf for leadership, McCoy's goals, etc. But I think at the time, you know, that that period, so that eighteen months. He could have played in the World eleven for me. So he goes in goal. What formation are you going to play? I'll go 4-4-2. Four, four, okay. Um, because both as a player and as a manager at certain times, I had a lot of, you know, we had a lot of success with that. Um, you've got to get the right players in the right. But I, I'll probably be shoehorning players in certain positions. But um, no, 4-4-2 four, four, um, would be my preferred uh, team. Well, where are you going to put yourself in that? You going to Right in the middle. And don't come out of that centre circle. Happy days. Okay, well, let's start across the bat line then. Full backs. Who are you going to choose in those areas? Again, play with some, some cracking players. Yeah, and, and I've got to say, I, I look back and I, I was very fortunate to play with some great teams, you know, all supported superbly, you know, from my from early days at Bradford, um, obviously to Everton, you know, from fantastic players, they're international players, up to Rangers, um, back to Bradford, and then finished off at Sheffield United, uh, which we had some great times there with. I, I'd like to think. It'd be only right to try to pick at least one player from each side. Um, obviously, the majority of my side will be, um, with seven great years out at Rangers, there'll be a lot of Rangers players in that. But I think to, to get a Sheffield United player in, um, again, some terrific players there, and we were very successful, um, would be Phil Jagielka. You know, I, I always thought from an early age, Jags from 18, 19, although he played centre midfield and he played right back um, for Sheffield, I always thought he was going to be a centre half. Um, read the game so well, quick. Um, but, but new, great, great intelligence, football intelligence. But he, he scored a goal against Leeds in the Cup for us um, as a young 19-year-old right back. And he, he, you know, he, he had great pace getting down, up and down when he played right back. So I'll play him at right back to get him in the side. Um, leader, you know, I'm going to fill me, certainly my back four with leaders because I think they're a dying breed now, leadership. We'll have a little bit more flair going forward naturally. But you know, at the back, although it's probably not his preferred position, to get him in, so I would have Phil Jagielka in there. Um, thankfully, he's gone back to Sheffield United now. I remember recommending him to Everton. I remember speaking to people at Everton when they took him from us at Sheffield United. Um, or took him from Sheffield United, should I say. And, um, you know, as had an outstanding career, went on and played for England, naturally. So, Jags would be in at right back. He goes at right back then. Opposite side, who are you going to go for? Some, again, it's, it's some great players you played with, north and south of the border. Yeah. Yeah, you don't have creative license with your full backs as well. They don't necessarily have to be. You could play another righty on the left, or you could have played two yeah. left. There's a bit of well, again, creative freedom. I'm in playing it. a left back, who again his favourite position is not left back, but I, I need to get him in the side, especially if it's my last game and it's winner take all. Um, I mean, I go back, yeah, in my Everton days, you know, Pat Van der mm. well, you know, what a what a difficult player he was to play against. You know, really um, tough off the part, but tough on it as well. So you know, likes a likes a part and then obviously David Robertson at, uh, at Rangers, you know, um, roommate of mine at times as well, up and down, had, you know, some great seasons there. But I think to, again, to get him in the team and we'll talk about leadership and we're talking about my last game, I would uh, pick uh, John Brown. You know, what a character, you know, old firm games he'd be, he'd have his stud sharp and done on his feet at one o'clock before we'd even got, you know, <laughs> got out of the off, off the coach. But um, yeah, again, Bomber was, uh, old school, you know, you know, he, he would give everything he's got, 
Um, played left back a lot. Played left back regular. Again, probably be better as a left centre back on a, a, in a three, whereas Jag, Jags could play in a three as well. Um, but to get you know people that I want to get in one from each club, um, I, I would play John Brown at left back. Again, when I look at it, he's captain. You know, his sides he's played for. Jaggy Elka's captain sides he's played for. A real leader, a real lead and, and force in the dressing room. You know, um, good. But you mentioned it. You know, he'd be the stood sharp and kind of jokingly yeah, before yeah. Old Firm. What was he like for, for an Old Firm guy? He must have been... Was he Was he one that was wired? He was, oh, yeah. Wired to them. I mean, normal days he was wired, <laughs> uh, bomber, but certainly in Old Firm games. Um, you know, frothing at the mouth. Um, but he was also... He, he had good band. I mean, we had a team of characters in them days, you know, and, that, and I think going back, you know, football was about characters mm. and bomber was certainly one of them. But he was always one that you could rely on and trust um, to give everything he'd got and if, if we needed it to be, you know, up and at him, then he was a man to do that. Also had a lot of quality, you know, he, he scored some terrific goals. Um, I remember actually, I had the one regret I had was never scoring against Celtic and uh, I made way for Bomber with an injury, I think we were 2-0 up at, at Parkhead. And uh, Bomber came on and scored and uh, celebrated over the hoardings with the Rangers supporters. And, couldn't believe it. Thinking, gosh, if he can score, and I can't score. What's a game coming to? But uh, yeah, uh, and a fellow ginger as well. So <laughs> he deserves to be in there. Um, bit of solidarity. So that's two full backs then, two centre halves. Yeah. Um, again, you know some some you know really good types um, that I've, I've played with at the back there. Uh, but I go th go to to me Everton days and talked about Neville Southall, and I think you know. It, it was, I say, struggling Everton side. It was a side that, you know, was in around sixth, seventh, eighth, from one that used to be challenging. So, they were, they weren't successful sides. Although we got to FA Cup final, and um, they'd been used to a little bit more success previously under under Howard Kendall. But for one, me, the, the captain, and again a stalwart, Dave Watson. Again, you talk about old school leadership. Maybe again, um, this day and age, playing out from the back wouldn't have been his forte. But I tell you what, if you want somebody to go put the head on the ball, somebody to make a tackle. Waggy used to play in training how we did in the game. You know, you'd take no prison. He'd be the f when I was picking teams at Everton, if you had to pick a side, uh, Waggy, Dave Watson would be the, on my team because I know if he were against me, he would kick me. You know, every, everything he did, his leadership qualities, his professionalism, um, wanting to win. You know, so the, you'll notice in my me, me back line, they're all winners. Mm. Um, need the strong back four because the rest of the team will go and, you know, do the, the, do the party pieces and the tricks and the individualism. Um, but so we need a strong back four that's going to stick together. And again, another one um, as a captain at Everton at the time. A great role model. Um, played to, again, I think Waggy might have played to his 40, um, along with the other centre half I'm going to mention. But uh, just a really good type, good pro. And uh, when you need him, when the tips were down, he was there. So again, if it's my last game, I want him beside me in the trenches. You mentioned the, the, the cup final you got to with Everton, the part of that team in, in 89. Yeah. Was the the '89 Cup final one of the hardest games you've had to play? In? Most were willing on Liverpool because of what had happened. With yeah, in a way, I think for my own self, um, you know, putting that aside, it was really difficult because I'd I'd played. In fact, I'd, I'd, I didn't score many goals for Everton, but I scored in the quarter final um, live on TV, which again there weren't many live games on that day. On the Sunday against the holders, Wimbledon, and we won one nil, um, and I'd played regularly that season, and then. Um, you know, fell out of the team with a couple of games to go, didn't play in the, in the semi-final. And then as we approached Wembley, um, in the final itself, I'd, I'd always been involved, always played in every game, but there were, there were two sub spots up and there were four of us. And I didn't know until after the pre-match meal that I was going to be a sub. I was hoping, but we had Wayne Clark, who's a centre-forward, um, Ian Wilson, who could play left-back midfield, um, and myself and, uh, and, and somebody else, which I can't quite remember. But... You know, um, we we ended up. I remember going up the steps after my meal. It was about half past twelve, and Colin Harvey, the manager, was behind me, and he'd not said anything for two floors. And I thought, this ain't good. I'm not going to be a sub. My family had come down, and he, uh, he says, Maka, as I was just going down the other side corridor to him, he says, you're uh, you're on the bench today, and so that's it. So once you're on the bench, then you want to get on. Mm. It was ninety odd degrees. It was the hottest, and you know the Wembley turf. So I got on with 60 minutes to go. Uh, sorry, with 60 minutes gone, you know, 1-0 down. Um, so then you've always got to try and make an impact when you come on. Unfortunately, 
you know, managed to score a goal later on, take it to extra time, and the rest is history. But uh, yeah, it was it was always going to be an emotional day, um, and it was a difficult day. But you know, we're there to for Everton to, to win, and you know, obviously we didn't reach our objective. So you've picked Dave Watson as one centre half, played with you at Everton. Who are you going to pick alongside him to to, to complete that back four? Yeah, well, I don't think it'd be a surprise. I'll go back to uh, captain of Rangers, who uh, was a fantastic leader on and off the park, Richard Goff. Um, great athlete, you know, early career Scotland, Dundee United players, right back, bombing right back because his, his energy levels was, were incredible. Um, up and down, great, uh, great desire again. You know, he set his standards, um, real good professional, good leader, um, and just a really good captain. Um, we used to always have not always, but a lot of times I've ding dongs because we both wanted to win, you know, deciding on in the in the midfield who should pick up the run or whatever. And but we did it because we both cared and we, we you know, had great respect for each other. Um, but no, I think Goffey would be would be there, you know, brilliant uh, servant for Rangers and for Scotland, um, and just a a really good type. To midfield, then you played with players like John Collins, Paul McStay mm -hmm. in the Gennaro Gattuso, though. Yeah. Played maybe out of position a bit and was a bit younger back then, mm -hmm. but you know, guys who went on to have fabulous careers. Who would you pick as, as your four in there now? Yeah, well, again, I'm going to score with sort of two, two wideish players. Um, uh, not realising I had to play in the middle of part myself, but <laughs> you know, because I had a few. Listen, we had, I had a, a really good partnership for early seasons, you know, before Gazza and Lauders came with Ian Ferguson. You know, mm -hmm. again, um, somebody who. You know, it was Rangers through and through. A great servant to the club, um, a good desire, goal scorer. You know, but hard worker. You know, not flamboyant maybe, but knew his role and did it well. Um, as you said, with, with Scotland, you know, Paul McStay, John Collins, Gary McAllister um, at Everton. You know, Peter Reid was only there a short period of time for six months, but in the six months, I learnt so much off off him. You know, fantastic uh, character, but again, as a professional, you know, the right things to do, how, how the game should be played. You know, he he was he was terrific in in, in that as well, um, and then and Trevor Stephen at times you know could come in the middle of the park. So Ian Durant, George Alberts, who if I wasn't in there myself would have been playing. Um, so alongside me in, in the middle would obviously be the, the one and only uh, Paul Gascoigne. You know, can turn games as he's shown against when we're going for eight in a row. His hat trick against Aberdeen. Nobody at the club. Nobody in Scottish football could have did what he did that day. You know, he just turned it on it for us. And um, great character. Unfortunately, room next to me for nearly the three seasons he was there. <laughs> um, I remember one day he came in in his fishing waders and shirt and tie. We always had to wear shirt and tie. Uh, I was in the gym and then I come down after after the gym session. Um, my shirt and tie, my trousers had gone and shoes and a pair of fishing waders were left for me, thank for him. So uh, I had to go to school and pick the kids up in fishing waders uh, and welly boots. But no, just a great character, um, generous as he could be, outstanding footballer. Um, did we see the best of him? C certainly in, in, in patches, you know, we, we saw brilliant and entertainer. But a midfielder that just did, I used to say to guys, listen, I'll do the dirty work, I'll get the ball and give it to you. But he would be backslide tackling, heading. He was an all-round midfielder, mm. although he had fantastic ability and, and skill and could go by people and, you know, good finisher. But he didn't mind doing the dirty work. He wasn't a you know, luxury player, if you like. Mm. He was one that was an old-fashioned midfielder. He could, well, he wasn't the greatest of tacklers, but he put a shift in for you. You know, he'd challenge in the air, he'd get back, he'd work hard for the team, he'd match runners. All the stuff that you know you don't expect of a, a forward attacking midfielder like he was, but um, he certainly was a team player. Although a great individual in the team we had, he was he was a team player as well, and you know he, he could change the game, you know, and the you know flick of his, his boot. Paul, yeah, find out in a minute why Stuart thinks things could have been very different for Gaza. Uh, but first, let's. Get me to tell you a bit more about Who Knows When. Uh, it's a sports app where you challenge your friends or the community over sports results. Download the app, then you can either join uh, public leagues that have already been created around things like the Premier League every weekend, or create your own custom league and invite your friends to play against you. You pick the fixtures you want to predict, uh, you set the entry fee, and you pick 
uh, the winning teams or draws for each game. Uh, the more people you have in your league, well, simply, then the bigger the pot. Uh, all you have to do is pick the match winners or draws. You can check out all the links on our Twitter at One Last Match or just One Last Match on Facebook. Uh, but for now, let's get back to Stuart McCall and his One Last Match. Paul Gascoigne, the player, do you think things could have been different for him like we could have seen more of the great Paul over yeah. the years if he'd maybe stayed at Rangers longer if he'd, if he'd stayed and had a manager to look after him the way yeah. that, that Walter did as much as yeah without a doubt I mean that was the saddest part of the, the last season you know going for the elusive 10 if you like and Gaza left halfway through the season went to I think Middlesbrough um, and it was sad really because I think when, when Paul had um, responsibility when his, his, his wife um and uh, you know the, the, the kids were up the road. They had responsibility to take him to school in the morning, picking him up at afternoon. Soon as that went, and you know his missus had gone back down to London. You know, what did he do in the afternoon? He went shooting. He went fishing. Game of snooker. Always probably ended up with a couple of beers. And he had no responsibility then, and a, a bit lonely, mm. if you like. You know, he obviously had his pals and five bells in that, but not having the kids around and his missus around, I think affected him a lot. His performances. He had a couple of injuries, um, and it, I don't think in that last season we saw the Paul Gascoigne we'd seen the previous two, and that was, you know, a, a major part in us not, you know, reaching what we wanted to. Um, I was going to say, do you think it could have been different? Yeah. If, if his family situation hadn't changed, if he'd yeah. had those kind of anchors to, to keep him going, you could have. It could have reached yeah. ten. He could have been I, the difference. And I think Walter and Archie we did fantastic for him, and I'm sure Paul would be first to say, you know, some of the scrapes he maybe got himself in and. You know, Walter stood by him, but it came to a stage where, you know, I'd say he'd gone off the rails a little bit. But it, again, I keep going back to the word responsibility, not having people there, not having too much time on his hands, you know, and he, um, not knowing what to do with his time and getting caught up in the, in the wrong things, maybe, um, which affected his football. As I say, he had injuries along the way. Um, and, you know, we had a lot of midfielders at the time. Young Barry Ferguson were coming through, Gattuso was there, Jonas Turner had come in, George Alberts could play in there, myself, Derek McInnes, Ian Ferguson, you know, we, we, had, we, we had a lot, a lot of midfielders. And I think it maybe got a stage where Walter couldn't maybe trust or rely on Paul at times, um, which was sad, really, um, because, you know, I've no doubt if, if you know, we had the Gaza the first two seasons that we, I had with him, you know, we, it, it would have been brilliant. But unfortunately, things off the field probably affected him as much as they did on it. Paul Gascoigne, the guy away from Paul Gascoigne, mm. the player, how good a guy was he yeah. to have in that group? Because you get the impression from speaking to the boys over the years that he was a real real gem of a lad, like there was not, he was a good-hearted fella to have in, in, in a group. The most generous person I've probably ever known, um, things he did. You know, I, I, listen, I could tell you stories and stories. And I got a Wembley, Euro 96. You know, I do an interview on a Friday night talking about my daughter who, um, you know, born in England but you know Rangers support because we were living up in Scotland at the time and um, playing against Gaza she wanted it to be three all Gaza to get a hat-trick and me to get a hat-trick well <laughs> hat-trick <laughs> of throw-ins for me maybe but um, and I'd, I'd done this on the interview and, and then before the game at uh, Wembley I'm not for one I just focus you know I'm not one for shaking people's hands before game. after game fine before the game I'm fully focused of course she's shaking Gaza's hand rightly so and Colin Henry's up against Shearer and um, Calderwood, Sheringham, you know, there were a lot of individual battles of people that played with each other at the clubs. Um, Darren Jackson had played with, with Gaz and I think that's for his shirt and things like that. I never even thought about asking for anybody's shirt. My focus, full of focus was on the game. Anyway, come off a game at half time, nil nil, to a few boos from the England fans because they'd been average, you know what I mean? We'd gone down there, Scotland, done a, done a job and I want a great game, but nil nil, we, we were quite happy with that. And as I'm going down the, 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 the tunnel to the dressing rooms, the concrete, you heard these, you know, footsteps, the studs, and I thought there was a bit of trouble, actually, a bit of, you know, a fracas behind me. And it was Gaza, and he came running by me. He took his shirt off, gave it to me, and says, that's for your daughter. Now, I had not once mentioned the shirt, didn't want a shirt. Oh, you know, certainly not half time. Give me a shirt. He'd gone off to his dressing room. I took the shirt, put it in my bag. He'd seen, obviously, an interview the night before, me saying my daughter would want Gaza to do well, get a hat trick. And he just says, that's for your little girl. He signed me afterwards. And it's the one where... You know, we after the game, Koisy swapped shirts with Gaza. Gaza gets a great goal in Euro '96 or whatever it was. Only like a player he can do. And we're going back up the road, um, back up to his base in the Midlands, and we're back at the bus. And you know, Koisy gets his shirt. I said, "Well, at least I've got a, you know Gaza shirt." 
and I went off on one. <laughs> the lads didn't order. I said, it's a disgrace. He's gone and probably knocked us out of the tournament. You're taking a shirt off him. You know, and, and he's saying, ah, but the lads are getting a bit, yeah, you're only jealous. I said, I'm not jealous. I've got the one he started the game <laughs> when he didn't score against us and pulled my shirt out. So, um, but yeah, and, and there's other stories. Listen, you know, give his you know, last penny away. We had a lad come in, we were in a pub and a young boy come in selling newspapers. I think it was 20p, the, the Glasgow Times. And the uh, guys had got a tenner from each player. I think they were about 12, it was 120 quid. Give 120 quid for a paper, the boy. Unfortunately, later on in the afternoon, we found out we were a Celtic supporter. A little boy <laughs> came in and gave Gaza, gave Gaza some stick. But yeah, you know, generosity, it give you anything you've got. Um, and a, a just, yeah, you know, it, 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 it's, you know, with a genius like he was on the football part, you know, you, you do get, you know, things away from that. And um, obviously, he had his demons. Uh, and, and unfortunately still does but you know as a, as a, as a guy when his head were on you know really good um, and as I said I, I, I changed next to him for almost three seasons and um, it was just a, a really good conscientious guy when his, his head was on You mentioned the kind of waders yeah. occurrence was that something you had to be to learn to be prepared for that with Paul there could be something around the corner. A joke would be would be minutes yeah. away. You, you couldn't turn your back. You couldn't rest. Yeah, but I, th I think, and he found out straight away on his first day. I think you know we had a lot of characters in the dressing room. You know, Ian McCoy and Durant to start with Ian Ferguson, John Brown. Um, we had a lot of characters. Myself, Gorham. We could all get up to a little prank. So I think Gaza knew he was a uh, you know up against a lot of Scottish boys. So he had to play it. But no, he was. Uh, he, he fell into everything that we were, and uh, he added. You know, obviously his, his ability on the park was was fantastic, and not only that, I think when the fans came, they knew they were going to get entertained, and we certainly got entertained in the dressing room, some of his stuff, but also the training ground. And uh, when he when he trained, he was brilliant. Do you ever manage to prank him properly? Uh, oh yeah, there's always been a few occasions, but uh, some of the things I don't think uh, can be aired. <laughs> <laughs> Phenomenal player to, to be alongside you. Then who are you going to play either side to to add to that midfield? Yeah, well. You know, again, going back to me, probably my early, early years my, at Bradford, um, John Hendry, um, you know, tiff, brilliant little little winger, John. Again, Scottish, come from Kirk and Tullock, supported the wrong side, the uh, wrong team in Glasgow right enough, but, um, you know, he was fantastic when we got promotion, going back to my early days at Bradford. Uh, but, you know, if I'm going to have a, I'm going to pick a player from my sides I've played with, um, I'm going back to Bradford, my second stint at Bradford when we got promoted to the Premiership, and that's Peter Beagre. You know, I played with Peter at, at, at Everton. It could be frustrating. I remember Graham Sharp going nuts. We never knew when the ball was coming in because he had the chop, did Beagues, he chop on his left, chop on his right. But I'll tell you what he did have. He had great quality. Um, left foot, right foot, he could hit balls from 30 yards. Um, he's got a fantastic goal against Leeds. Um, I remember top corner. Um, great cross of the ball, good in the air. Wanted to work hard for the team, although he's a winger, you know, he, he would do his bit up and down, didn't mind a tackle. Um, yeah, d d different to most wingers, you know, he, 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 he liked the hard work side of it, um, but he had great ability, uh, you know, and the, the year we got promoted to the Premiership, um, he was he was massive in that, you know, he used to tear full backs to bits, and we had Lee Mills and Robbie Blake down the middle, and he, he used to provide great ammunition for them. Um, so I, w I would have Beagues. Um, you know, on the on the left hand side, um, because you know, if I'm going to play with two forwards, they certainly need ammunition and, and anyone who could deliver. I would have to tell them to get the ball in a bit earlier because it's only 90 minutes in a game. <laughs> but other than that, um, you know, for his ability, then uh, he, he would be in. Is he one who's in because you've seen the quality close up, the way he yeah. impacts on a team you play? Do you play with the guys, you know, like Davy Cooper in there at different yeah. times with Scotland briefly and yeah. other other fantastic wide players or guys who could play wide but for he, you he made an impact on one of your teams in a big way yeah exactly I think it, what, what he did you know to get us promoted you know again, again going, if, if talking about left hand siders um, Kevin Sheedy at Everton mm. you know brilliant left foot fantastic you know top player good lad um, you know Big Mikhailichenko, um, certainly not a workaholic. He wasn't even an alcoholic, really, but, <laughs> um, although I could <laughs> put that a few of our lads. Um, but great ability. Peter Hooster, you know, as well. And, you know, so there were, we Durante could play out on left at times. George Alberts could play up on left. Um, but I think, you know, again, looking at trying to get one from each side, the, pro the, the promotion side um, that Bradford did to Premier and staying in the Premiership for a year against all odds, you know, Beaks was, was, was massive to that. And, um, you know, good good character. Um, again, good part. Of, you know, likes a laugh. Life and soul of the dressing room, which we've got a lot of them. 
Um, I mean, normally we'd struggle to get a word in with Beegs about, but I think some of the players we've got in there and characters in there, it'd be a, a free-for-all. Certainly they wouldn't need a microphone, that's for sure. Three spaces left then in your team, mm -hmm. wide right. Yeah, again, whether it's his best position, um, again, he could play along anywhere along the front, um, but I don't think it'd be a surprise. Brian Laudrup, absolutely magician with the ball at his feet. He could go by people for fun. His balance was fantastic for such a tall lad. Um, he was six foot... Um, not the greatest header of a ball, but he did get the one header that you know clinched his nine in a row, which was was brilliant. I don't it was much bigger surprise there. Charlie Miller crossing <laughs> with his left foot or Lauder's heading it in. Um, but I remember when Brian came, um, I was up up in the stands one game. I, I was injured for the Celtic game, and ten minutes in, I, I can't remember if it was Tom Boyd or Tosh McKinley. It was almost a 60-40 in front in Brian's favour, but he sort of jumped out of it a little bit. I remember going down at half time and saying to him, "Listen." I know you're a winger, you're not famous, you know, you're know, you not renowned and you're not on the park to do your tackles, but in these games you cannot jump out of tackles. Um, and he looked at me a bit and, and I never realised that what career would go on to have. You know, I'm looking at him, somebody jumping out of tackles in an old firm game, I'm thinking, is he the right type we needed? But that was just a one-off. He went on to show um, he, he had uh, great courage as well, not in 50-50s, but taking, ball, taking the ball in tight areas. Um, he won many games for us on his own when we needed him when we needed somebody to stand up and, and, and score a goal for us or beat three men and create something then he was at the front of that um, again bought into the the, uh, the the sort of culture of what we had in the dressing room did that know. take him yeah. long? Oh, or, no, or, or did yeah, he it, it took it was, it was quite reserved Brian at times but then you know he started knocking around with Andy Gorham and um, once they visited the wine cellar and it was all over I remember I remember Walter we went away in pretty uh, close season. We we're going to um, Monte Carlo. We used to go there for. I think Mark, Big Mark, used to sort it out. We played at Monaco, um, and went over there. And I think it was me, John Brown. It might have been the goalie uh, who weren't going because we were injured. And uh, Walter had come up the day before they were going off and says, "At least I don't have to worry about with the lads that are going. You know, you three are staying here. You know, to get treatment. I don't have to worry. There's any pranks going on in the hotel." And great. Joy did we find out the day they were there. I think Laudrup was getting wheeled about in a wheelchair in the lift. It was paralytic. And, <laughs> and I remember Walter coming back and said, well, at least I knew what you three were giving me. But when you see Lauders in a state like that, you think you've got to worry. So, yeah, he bought into that. Listen, it wasn't all about... I know Richard Goff came out with this, this saying, the team that uh, drinks together, wins together. There was a lot of being that as a, a camaraderie and, you know, being together. Um, but, yeah, Brian certainly... Um, was was all for one, one for all when we were going out. He, he was there and he liked the social side of it, like like we all did. Um, but listen, no getting away from him. He, he was a magician with the ball. Um, probably playing down the middle off a striker could have been good position playing on the left. But on the right, you know, I think fullbacks used to know. Oof, you know, if you're up against Louder, you need you need your you know two men backing up on him because he he, he could take take people out of the game with just a. Um, his hips, you know, and it, it, I mean, we used to think we had good defenders at this club, you know, in the likes of Richard Goff and, and John Brown and Gary Stevens and people like that. Landrup used to turn up bits in training, I and mean, I think Walter used to have to say to me, lay off because you're demoralising the confidence, you know, it was that good in training, Brian. Um, but yeah, so you'd have to find a place for him. Um, big open park at Hamden, I'm sure he'd, uh, he'd love that, as he did. You know, in the in the '96 Cup final, although it gets called the Loudrup Cup final, he got two. Gordon Jeremy, good pal, got <laughs> got three, and it still gets called the Loudrup Cup final. But um, yeah, when we beat Hearts five one, that we, he was outstanding that day. Yeah, he'd be an impressive performer at Hamden. You've got him, Peter Bigger on the far side to provide the ammunition. Mm -hmm. Who are the two boys through the middle who are gonna reap the rewards from that? Yeah, well, I always like I always like a, a big striker um, when I've been managing, and obviously as playing and. Going back to my, my early stint at Bradford, the late great Bobby Campbell was an outstanding centre forward. Got a couple of caps playing in lower level for no, uh, playing at lower level um, in the Northern Ireland squad. Got a couple of caps, went to the World Cup. Um, Bobby's the only centre forward I've ever seen score a goal with his head from outside the box, and it was in training, and I know it because I crossed it for him. And it, but talk about old-fashioned centre forwards, um, character. Oh. You know, unbelievable, but great centre forward, leader, leading the line, goal scorer, strong, physical, and we had a few of them. You know, going, you know, going through to, to me Everton days. Graham Sharp, you know, brilliant again, um, fantastic striker, um, hold up play, all round. You know, could look after the ball, great in the air, 
um, up to Rangers. Dun Big Duncan Ferguson came in for a spell and went obviously to Everton and had you know, probably his best years at Everton, um, but played with him in Scotland as well. Um, another old-fashioned number nine, um, you know, that, that was, it was terrific in the air. Um, but, you know, one I'd have to have in there, again, for a season or so, almost carried us a lot in there, I think I can't remember which season, 93, 94, 94, 95 season, by big Mark Hately. Um, again, you know, I, I think defenders feared against him physically, but also quite quick when he got in his stride. I remember my first Old Firm game, I managed to play him through just over the halfway line. He run 40 yards around the keeper and put it in. And uh, So even for a big lad, he didn't carry a lot of weight, but physically was strong, strong in the air, great header of a ball, great left foot, you know, good left foot as well. Um, so, you know, he would be one if you got Beagley crossing the balls from the from the left and, and loud up the same. You know, you couldn't get anyone better getting on the end of him than uh, than Big Mark. Who you put with him? The obvious uh, one. Yeah, well, the obvious one. Yeah, um, we did, aren't we? No. <laughs> yeah, again, you know, centre forwards um, you know, at, at Everton. Um, like it, somebody who's going to play along a big man. You know, Tony Cotty, good pal of mine. You know, TC. Um, you know, we could always sniff goals out. Really predator, a great finisher. Um, so he, he's, you know, he's worth a mention. Um, but I think, you know, when it, it, it comes down to it, um, you know, obviously you've got to have Mr. Goals, um, Super Ali, Ali McCoyst, you know, and again, character, you know, no bigger character, but um, he's one of them, you know, if I'd missed some of the chances he missed, two or three, I would never go back in penalty box. But, you know, no, I'm not, but 300 and odd goals for Rangers, and, and, and it's incredible the goals he got. I mean, he could sell a video alone on his goals he scored against Celtic, you know, he's. Um, just a great finisher, um, but a winner, a desire. People see Coyce would be laughing and joking when he scores his goals, all these celebrations. Tell you what, he, he, he had a few ding-dongs with Goffey in training and that. He could stand up for himself. Hardy boy, you know, as much as you see the, um, you know, the question of sport, the, the, the amiable guy, the laugh and the joke, he had a mean streak in him. Um, and as Big Mark did, so you know, not only did when players were coming up against them think this is going to be hard because you know we're up against you know quality, they both could take the stick, they could take the kicks, they could take the knocks, and come back for more. But um, you know, Coyce was always in the right place at the right time. And as I say, yeah, he'd miss he'd miss some, but he, would, he had the courage to be back, put himself back in there and back himself. Um, you know, not long ago, well, a few years ago now, I've done my knee, but he used to play in you know five or side games on a Thursday, and he was the same. Never I mean, had a kick for half an hour, then bang, goal. Uh, and that's what it was like. And we used to know, I remember going down after we beat Leeds in the, in the Champions League, European Cup, whatever it was, at home 2 1, everyone was writing us off. But we always knew if we had McCoy's and Haley in the team, we'd score goals. And we went down there, Haley got one early on, McCoy's got a fantastic goal, great team goal, great at diving header. Um, so yeah, them, them two is a partnership. It's nice to have a partnership. Yeah, I could have gone for the players, but you know when Hayley and McCoy were, were, were together on form and clicking, um, and you know he's got good hand and uh, memories as well. So Coyce would have to be, would have to be up there with Big Mark, and you know yeah we've got a bit of flair in the side. We've got leaders at the back, um, great professionals. Dressing room would be a night out would be fantastic. <laughs> that's for sure, and it probably won't be a night. It'd be a couple of nights, um, but all round, you know I think that's. Formidable tide. You mentioned that Battle of Britain mm. clash with we, we Leeds, the, the two games, 92 93. I think you listened to the commentary of that, again, the commentary saw the, you know, the intensity around Ibrox, it almost hurts, it was such an atmosphere. Yeah. Was that one of the the moments that stands out, those, those two games, just because yeah. of the, the way it was built up, what was riding on it, and how well obviously you guys did? Yeah, especially for myself, you know, I mean, my dad used to play for Leeds, I was born. Um, you know, corner kick away from from Ellen Road and lived for my first eighteen month uh, eighteen month of my life there, and used to follow Leeds home and away as a kid. Um, but Rangers were always my team, um, you know, my, my big team. But you know, as a lead supporter, and um, to, to play them in the Battle of Britain, um, we said. But I think you know, from a personal point of view, I think we had Trevor Stephen, myself, Ian Ferguson, and Durant was a midfield four. But we were going up against probably the best four midfielders um, collectively. You know that. Certainly, the English Premiership had, had at the time. You know, you, you had the late great Gary Speed on one side, we Gordon, Gordon Strachan on the other side. You know, so you had great ability. Um, Gary Mack in the middle of the park and David Batty. You know, so they had everything in that midfield four. So for me, that was always going to be a huge test. Um, 
And I remember Walter before the game pulling me aside and saying he was going to be playing me on the left of a four, which I'd never really played. And it was to combat Gordon having an influence on the game. We Durante played inside with uh, Ian Ferguson. And after 20 minutes, we were one nil down. I'd not had a kick of the ball. I was just, Gordon, I'd try to stop Gordon playing. But then Walter moved it and I felt I got more involved in it. Because it was a, it was a, it's like a derby game. You know, it's an old fashioned Scotland v England type game. Um, and yeah, so we, we obviously managed to, to win two. And I, and I, I remember the full time whistle going and it was a head of a, not booze, it was a, a big side because we should have won by more than two you know on the night the, the, the second half we had a good chance we should have should have gone been going down Illinois with three three one victory at least and I think there was a sort of a belief that we'd maybe missed the trick and lost this chance but we knew in the dressing room no matter what people were saying down in England and um, with the squad we had that we could go down there and cause problems and you know thankfully that's what we did and then you go down and his goal is <laughs> ridiculous yeah it, it, what was that whole match like to get over the line in that game? How 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 were the emotions of playing in that down there, the atmosphere? Yeah. You know, the opposite atmosphere to what you had. Well that's right, because obviously, you know, Leeds didn't get any tickets to to, to come to uh, to Ibrox, although you know, we did a few deals with Gary Mack, because Gary Mack's family were, you know, a range of supporters and I did it. Likewise I got a few tickets for my brother and brother in law to go down to go down at Ellen Road. But there was no range of supporters <clears throat> officially. So a bit like what they did to us, Gary Mack scored an unbelievable goal after 60 seconds at Ibrooks. Big Mark goes and smashes one in, although it might have been John Luke Kikera. Um, it was still a great strike and put us in a, a good position. And then, the, uh, having said that, we had a lot of defending to do. The Canton had up front, you know, they had, a, they had a really good side, the Leeds. Gordon was brilliant that night, as was John Brown, Richard Goff. Defended really well, which we had to do. And then we scored a fantastic team goal, broke out from our half, McCoy's diving header to go 2-0 up. Um, and I remember getting... You know, the, the uh, Yorkshire reject. I remember clocking a couple of boys in the, the cop that I used to go to the Leeds games with, you know, go to school with, and I, I give them the 2 0 sign. I promise it was a 2 0 <laughs> sign, but, um, you know, I got a little bit of stick for that. But yeah, and then we, you know, I remember big things I remember. I remember coming after the game. I remember the, the evasion, Leeds fans staying behind and clapping us off, which was fantastic sportsmanship. I remember coming in and Gorham being absolutely gutted because he'd lost a goal. You know, he would outstand that. And I don't know if he had a big bet on a clean sheet, but he was, And the first person out with our club in the dressing room was Sir Alex Ferguson. You know, and he went round every player, you know, he'd been there. And as it happened, we were going back to Manchester to, to stay before flying back up the road. And uh, we had a great night in Manchester that night. But um, so, yeah, it was, a, it was special. I think prior to the game, everyone, a lot of, I remember ex Leeds players. Um, you know, like Scottish players had been asked in the paper and it wasn't a case of, you know, who was going to win, it was by how many. You know, and that was a bit of a slap and I think a lot of the English press down here thought it was going to be a cakewalk for, England, uh, for Leeds, the English club. But um, thankfully it wasn't and that was a, you know, a special night. Didn't lose a game in the rest of the, the yeah. Champions League. Yeah. You get through, you, you a stone's mm. throw from making it to, to the mm. finals play, a fabulous AC Milan side. Does it niggle you at all? The way things evolved after, you know, the, uh, the match fixing accusations that, in terms of the league business yeah. in France that followed, and some of the matches within that group were, were kind of pointed <laughs> out. Uh, the last game against Bruges was one of the ones that was highlighted. That's Look, right. Yeah. Does that uh, niggle with you now? <laughs> Not really. Um, no time for regrets, really. We were, well, as you said, we had 10 games in Europe undefeated. Um, we went with the, f the fifth game of the group. Obviously, there were six group games to go to Marseille, and we knew winner takes all. If we'd have won at Marseille, and Marseille had a fantastic side. They were 2-0 up against us at uh, Ibrox. We come back, scored two late goals, kept in the group. Um, and again, talking about Regenani, comes up with big goals, scored a fantastic goal there, drew one all. Um, and I, I think what stuck in my mind was the sixth game um, against uh, CSK uh, Moscow at home was after the final whistle went, and we'd put everything in the game. You know, was, uh, But we knew... We had to uh, better Marseille result, and I think uh, they went and won in Bruges, one 0 So it was irrelevant, really. But was as soon as the final whistle went, the CSKA players celebrated it as if they'd won the World Cup mm. or the Champions League. And it, looking back, I think well, they'd only just gained a point. You know, they're still. I think it was a first or second point in the group. You know, they weren't doing anything. And then when you la hear later on, years down the line, about bribery, and you just always wonder, wonder if they were on an extra incentive. You know, to, to, to get something out of the game because it wasn't as though they did anything. But no, I, I, listen, I look back on it, it was what it was. Um, you know, I, I don't know. Um, obviously, they got the, the trophy later off taken off them. Um, it would have been fantastic to play in a final. But, you know, we, we had that game in Marseille. And I, and I think, 
everyone looks back. Big Mark got sent off against Bruges prior to that and missed out in that game. Uh, and we certainly missed him over there, although we Durante came in and scored a fantastic goal for us. Um, you know, you always look back and think, if only, but then again you look back and think, you know what, what great success. I think that season went 44 games undefeated, 10 in Europe. Um, you know, so you, you, I, I never look back and think, was there anything going on? Um, you know, it, it was just, we've got to accept it, um, take it on the chin and you know, unfortunately it, uh, that, hap that happened. That was the Marseille team had like Alan Box, and yeah. Steve Voller oh. and fabulous players, Basil Polly yeah. obviously. That's right. Do, do you did do you think... a jump in middle of park? Yeah, they had some you know top players. So to go toe to toe with a team mm. like that, say not lose a game through that run, yeah. do you think if things had been different and you got to the final, you could have given that Milan team a run for the money because that was a, a fabulous yeah, Milan team. Yeah, yeah, of course. And and I think what would bear that out, people like off, oh, no, because we always knew because um, we'd shown it that season. A number of times we went behind in games, but we all had a great belief in ourselves. Leeds at home. Prime example, you know, went behind two 0 at home to Marseille, went behind, come back to two all. So yeah, you know, if we'd gone against Milan, um, as you said, the, the players that uh, Marseille had, the, the, the all internationals, all top class players, um, to be two 0 down and come back and, and 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 get a point against them in the in the game at Ibrox was fantastic. So yeah, here you listen, you never know in hindsight, Milan might have spanked us, but um, we had because we had belief in each other that even if we went behind, we had players in the side that could mix it. Not only great ability, and and, and we we talk about the Rangers era, and you go, we go on to the likes of Gascoigne and, and Laudrup and Alberts, and you know f outstanding individual talent we had. The most successful season was 92, 3, 92, 93 season. You know, the likes of Ian Ferguson and David Robertson, and a lot of you know unsung heroes in the side that we we had. Dale Gordon played on the right hand side for us at times, and um, you know big Dave McPherson, and, and 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 you know a lot of lads um, who not thought of. When you think of the Rangers' success of the nine in a row, you know, likes of Loudrup and Gascoigne always come to your mind. But the 92 93 season was the most successful um, that the club had, and you know, we won the treble, and it was, you know, it was fantastic. Team of winners you've picked, team of uh, guys you won a lot of with mm. through the course of the career, by and large. We give you the option now to play a joker, play a wild card. You can put into your team one of the opposition players you faced through your career to enhance the side you've put together. Who would you pick? Someone you faced for club or country that you think would just be an addition to what we've already got. Oh. you played against some, some fabulous, we've named some of the guys there who've played in, yeah. you played against them in Europe and domestically as well, in the great Liverpool forward line, yeah. you mentioned the, the Celtic oh. teams you played, you mentioned the, the Marseille team there, some of the yeah. players in that. Yeah, I mean, like to you know, go back to my Liverpool days, Peter Baisley, everyone talks about now this magic number 10 on playing off the front. Peter Baisley's been playing number 10 for years, you know what I mean, This in the whole position, he, he was that intelligent. You know, I'm very difficult for me as a midfielder to pick up because he always played behind me. Football intelligence, um, and Liverpool had a top side then. But I think when when I've asked, been asked this before, uh, I've always gone back to probably one um, Paulo Souza, who played for for Portugal and Juventus, because in in the three games I played against him, um, Portugal beat us five nil, Juventus beat us four nil at Ibrox and beat us four one over there. So we had an allied score of thirteen to one, and I remember. Um, you know, coming off a game, I think it was a, the Portugal game, the five 0 game, and he wanted to swap shirts with me, and I said, "Oh, Titan Army four thousand there, and now don't be swapping shirts with Portugal. They'll just beat us five 0 uh, And as soon as we went down there, and it was a big long corridor underneath the stadium there, and uh, once we got you know off the park and underneath, I went chasing him. I swapped shirts now. <laughs> I didn't want anyone to see me swap shirts out on the pitch because I wanted to keep his shirt. But I swapped shirts with him. So. He was a, a, a top-class midfielder, but because I, th I think of you know the 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 um, one's a bit of a doing. Um, I think we'll look. At, I think Goffey got the one for us. So yeah, he would probably be the player that I had my toughest time against. So if I were having one to come and take my position, he would do a great job in the middle of the park. To wrap things up, then the final question I put to you is: if you could go back and change one thing from your career or life until this point. What do you think it would be? You've got a chance to sign off in style now with your with your perfect team, with your perfect setting, yeah. the perfect finale. But if there's one that you could go back and change, what, what do you think it might be? Um, I, I would go back and change certain games, but I wouldn't have no regrets. I think I've been so fortunate to play in such in front of such fantastic loyal supporters of the, the clubs I've played for. All got big support um, with some great players, great teams, great managers. For somebody with 
you know, a, a, an average level of ability. So I've never any regrets in my, my football career. I think I've been very fortunate. Certain games, obviously, home at Kilmarnock, last game I played at Ibrox, going for 10 in a row, we get beat. Um, the Scotland, England, Euro 96. If Gaz Mack penalty, Seema makes a great save, you know, we could have won that. Um, there's always little little games that you think, you know, if you could go, go back and play. Um, but no, I was I was very fortunate, you know, made my debut at 18, been in the game since I was 16, I played till I was 40. You know, I, I think I was three games off a thousand, not many people know, three games off a thousand competitive games. Um, you know, and if you throw the good ones in, I'd probably get a thousand. But yeah, no, I, I've, I've no regrets. I was out, probably not regret, but is in the nine in a row season, you know, I missed, um, I had a, a serious knee injury and I missed the biggest part of that. I remember playing in the first 13 games, seven league games and cup games. Um, but, you know, having that knee injury, but I was fortunate with injuries as well. To play that many games, I was, I was lucky. So, uh, no, certain games, yeah, like I say, I would, I would go back and play, but I wouldn't change anything because um, I've been really lucky to play with some fantastic players under some great managers in front of some great fans. Just that chasing of the ten mm. is that one of the more difficult seasons because it kind of it was the first trophyless season for you yeah. at, at Rangers as well, and obviously yeah. it ultimately was you yeah. said your goodbyes beyond it as well. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was sad. We obviously got beaten in the cup final at Hearts. I remember going to the dressing room after the game. Me, McCoy, Steve, and me, Durante. Thought it was going to be an end for us all. I had still another year left. Dick Advocat was coming in. He wanted to keep me, but I thought it was end of an era. Walter going, Archie going, all the great players going. Um, it was time for a, you know, a new broom, and uh, from, we we brought down in the dressing room. Then we ended up going back up. And think, listen, it's been it's been difficult, but let's look back on the good times. Um, so people say to me, "Do you regret uh, not doing ten? Well, obviously, it'd be nice to do ten, but I have to tell you, I'd have regretted not getting to nine. Gaza's hat trick at um, uh, Aberdeen and you know you know th the things we went through. I mean that, that the season, um, Tommy Burns is Celtic. He only lost one game that season. We lost three. When I joined the club the season before, Big Mark Haley scored his two goals against Aberdeen. So I got to look back and think we're grateful to get the chance to get to nine. So yeah, it, it, getting to ten would have been great, um, fantastic. But I tell you what, missing out on the nine would have been the worst thing. So to get to nine still holds a lot of pride, and you know you can see I had my testimonial. Um, at Bradford and you know, nearly 12,000 Rangers supporters came down and the lads all came out in the nine in a row t-shirts and kit and they sang nine in a row throughout the, I mean Bradford fans still talk about it, they didn't watch the game, they just watched the supporters so um, no, no regrets, um, it was sad and difficult to leave that, that season, even if we'd beat Hearts in the cup final it would have been something. Um, but Celtic had got we started getting a, a squad together. We we lost started losing players that had been stalwarts: John Brown, David Robertson, Paul Gascoigne. Um, you know, people like that. We'd had a few injuries, um, so and and new players were coming and were evolving. But it was just um, one step too far, unfortunately. The players are moving on. The manager was going to move on. Yeah. Do you think, in hindsight, if that hadn't emerged, if you didn't know that, it would have made a difference? No. Or does do you know, I've got to say, obviously, Brian Lauder had signed a pre-contract for Chelsea. Everyone knew from January he was, he was going to Chelsea. So once he has a bad game, it's because his mind's on Chelsea, which is nonsense. Walter decided he was going to move on. Um, there were players who were coming to the end. Goffey had gone to Kansas and came back during that season. But no, you can, you can look at lots of things. But bottom line is, we, I think we lost two of the last four games. We had a great run. We beat Celtic in the Cup and the, the, the league and put ourselves back in a strong position. But we went to Pataudry and got beat 1-0. And the, the last home game against Kilmarnock. If we if we win that, you know, we'll probably go on and, and do ten. So with all the other things that you can look at, the bottom line was, you know, it was still in our hands. Um, and that Kilmarnock game, you know, again, um, we had opportunities to, to win that, and we, we just couldn't. It was one of them games. But uh, yeah, no, 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 certainly no regrets of uh, my career, and certainly not my Rangers career. So no regrets mm. about your career. We talked through your team. Mm -hmm. to play your final game now as we reimagine things. Who would you want to play against? You've got your team picked, mm -hmm. you walk out at Hampden Park, yeah. who are you going to line up against? I think that's quite an easy one for me because you know I've been fortunate wherever I've been. Started off at Bradford, had some good local derbies with Huddersfield and, and Leeds at the time. Um, moved to Everton, again, won on many uh, winning sides, only one, but the Everton-Liverpool Merseyside derby was brilliant. Obviously Rangers Celtic, go back, um, playing a Sheffield United, Sheffield Wednesday derbies, I was fortunate to have good success there. Even Scotland, England, 
you know, the, the Euro 96 game, only managed to play one game. But that, the whole surrounding of that, so I would have to pick a derby game, you know, to, if it was my last game. And obviously, probably the biggest derby, more people say in the world, certainly atmosphere wise, the intenseness would be an old fern derby. And I would pick this, you know, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, I never managed to beat Celtic um, at Hamden in a, in a cup final because we beat them four times in the semi-final previously and in a quarter-final, I had to get that in. Um, but, it, you know, I, I used to love them games. If I could play every game against Celtic, I'd, it was just something I, I thrived on. It cost me a few quid in tickets right enough for the games, but um, I loved everything about it, the, the build-up, the tension, the atmosphere. Fortunate in 20-odd games only to lose, I think, three or four. Um, but if you want to go out and you play your last game, you want to play against a side that you think you're going to beat. And thankfully, I had such a good record against Celtic. I think it'd be a stonewall victory, and that'd do me. Happy days. There you go. That is your dream way to bow out. You've got your team. You're playing them at Hamden. You're playing against Celtic. Mm -hmm. You think you've got a victory to bow on as well? And I'm going to get the winner because I never scored against them. Okay, it's the world of fantasy. We can make that come true as well. We can push the boundaries. <laughs> Stuart McCall, thanks for being a guest on this edition. That is it. It is never too late to play one last match. Thanks to Stuart McCall. This week, some very interesting choices in his side. Uh, just one final time for me to remind you to get involved in Who Knows When, a new app that really is shaking up the sports entertainment industry. You can challenge your mates for real money and, crucially, for bragging rights. Uh, this is what Who Knows Wins is all about. Uh, download the app, uh, create your league, select your fixtures across well, football, rugby, tennis, horse racing, whatever you want. Uh, say your entry stake, you make your predictions, then invite your pals to come in and challenge them to beat your guesswork. Grow that pot and then win the money. But of course, when it comes to the bragging rights, well, then winner takes all. I get it on the App Store or Google Play right now. Uh, who knows wins? It's simple. Put your money where your mates are. And while you're there, of course, downloading it, make sure you rate, review and subscribe to One Last Match and catch up on previous episodes if you've missed them. The likes of Gary Palster and John Hartson. And next week, our guest will be the former Chelsea and Leicester legend, Frank Sinclair. You can keep up to date with the latest from One Last Match on Twitter via at One Last Match and just search for One Last Match on Facebook. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next week for One Last Match. Audio Frontier.